It's good to see everyone here this morning. I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Titus, the second chapter. We're in lesson three of our outlines. We've been looking at the text that will affect our lives, affects our homes, affects our marriages. God has spoken, will we hear? And we're here to heed, not only hear the word of God, but to put it into practice. And so we need to understand exactly what we're we're talking about when we read these things that Paul wrote to Titus, uh, first century AD. We're in the 2022, we're a long way away, but those principles and that, those commandments haven't changed. And you'll notice that God reveals his word, shows his divine wisdom that he's not gonna be kind of governed by, by time, like in the dress code. It's modest, it's shamefastness, it's sobriety. That's, that's the attitude of the mind. So women that are living in different ages, they're gonna have a sober-mindedness, they're gonna have a sense of shame about their nakedness, they're gonna have those things and, and make it appropriate to dress of this day than they were maybe even dreamed about in the first century. And we see the things about the home, those principles that hold the marriage together, the respect that God offers the husband and the wife for each other, and especially for the Lord, brings a unity, brings a godliness that man can never improve upon. It's not a, uh, well, it's a 50-50 thing about subjection in my home. No, it's, uh, it's all as unto the Lord. And what we'll see in Ephesians 5.24, and we'll let that be a commentary on what we're about to study in Titus, is that women are to be in subjection to their husbands in everything. But verse 22 of Ephesians 5 says, your subjection is to be as unto the Lord. There's the point when you marry a woman that is going to be subjecting herself unto the Lord. She'll subject herself unto you in everything that is justified and authorized by the Lord. She's not gonna let you, she's not gonna go out and get your drinks for you and get you drunk. She, I, I told her to go do that. She's supposed to be in subjection to everything. As unto the Lord. And we're a blessed as husbands when that happens. Women are blessed when husbands love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for it. There's that self-sacrifice that a husband has for his wife that shows, I just don't love you. I'm showing by my life and my relationship with you. I will, I will die for you. I put you first. And my thinking about how I can benefit you a uh, spiritual leader in the home. Ephesians 5 deals with those things. We're just picking up what here in Titus about the home environment and something was very strange at their time. You had to train the younger women to love their husbands. We talked about that a little bit. There's, sometimes there were arranged marriages, maybe two kids were arranged by their parents when they're four or five and they don't, they don't grow, they grow up, they don't really love each other. They're not attracted to one another. We fall into love in our society. We get attracted sexually and, and, and they tell, you know, you, you, I just like to be around that person. And we fall into love. Sometimes there was already, you, now you love. And they were to train, and the type of love he speaks there is phileo love, which denotes a sense of, of belonging. Agapeo love says, I value you. That's why I can value a enemy because he's created in the image of God. I can show value unto him and I'm to have that kind of love. I value my wife so I love her and I follow the example of Jesus of giving myself up for her. Uh, that's the, the harmony and that's the respect and that's the joy of a, of a unified family arrangement. It's, it's, it's all unto the Lord and we benefit from that. But in this context, she had to train them because they were not used to having that natural affection. Uh, and we might see this in marriages that have children already in them. Somebody has died, somebody's divorced for the right reason, and you marry somebody like that, that you have a right to marry. They have children, you may not have that natural affection. Uh, and these people were like that. They were murdering their kids a lot of times in sacrificial uh, sacrifices unto their gods, pagan idolatry. They had no natural affection for their kids. They, they said, well, we'll just offer them up to God. You had to, you had to overcome that mentality, that, that culture. Uh, Christians were to be involved. And so you train 
Older women, you train the younger women. You teach that which is good. Part of that is to have that sense of belonging in your home for your husband and for your children. And by the way, we read now in Titus, the second chapter, not only being workers at home, which we talked about last time, that's where your energy is focused. That doesn't mean you cannot work away from the house, but you're focused upon the family. And then he says, be in subjection in verse five to their own husbands. There's a sense of belonging to their own husbands that the word of God be not blasphemed. So we see I'm to be in subjection. What does the word mean in subjection? Let's just put the cold facts out there. What is one word that is just, I don't want to say this, but that's what it means. It means obey, obey. It really means to bring yourself under another. He speaks, and we're, we're going to follow the lead. He's, God has made him the head of the house. I married the guy. And I'm, I'm, I subjection myself as unto the Lord. And we're going to, and that's why Paul could say that the unbelieving husband is sanctified in the wife. That means he's sanctified from his sins. Is that he's living in an environment that is going to set him apart from the world. Because he sees her at chaste behavior, her behavior. And hopefully through that behavior, he can be one unto, unto the Lord. That's 1 Peter 3. That's, that's putting the whole Bible together of all the things that are happening when a wife says, I'm going to submit to my husband because I'm submitting unto the Lord first. These things are going to happen. And the benefits are going to be there. That's why Paul says, when an unbeliever doesn't want to stay with you, let him go. Who knows if you'll save your husband? You don't. But while he's there, help him see what a sanctified life looks like. And you be in subjection unto your husbands. You obey them. And just to, what, what, is that, is that, that's kind of stark? Yes, but that's what 1 Peter 3. Let's just get another apostle on board here. 1 Peter 3, here is a wife that's married to an unbeliever. And she, he will not be won by her worthiness but by her chaste behavior, if he's going to be one at all. So what does a woman do? Well, I don't know if I'll save him or not. Okay, you don't know if you do, but you, you need to live a chaste life anyway. You're under the Lord, aren't you? So you serve the Lord, you live that sanctified life, he'll benefit from it, and maybe he'll come around to be a Christian. You don't know, but you'll do what's right. See, the wife needs to be doing what's right, and that will hopefully affect the, the husband. She doesn't quit doing what's right. So we see in 1 Peter 3 that Peter uses an example from of, of old. Verse 4, but let it be the hidden man of the heart, not the outward apparel, but the inner, man, inward manner, uh, manner of the heart, the incorrupt apparel of a meek and quiet spirit, which is the sight of, of God a great price. Far explanation. Here's an example. For this the matter aforetime, the holy women themselves being in subjection to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. Now, I'm not saying you've got to wake up every morning and call him Lord. That may be, uh, you know, that's not our culture. But you obey him. You submit to him. And there's the point. And, and, of course, we see that that was her attitude about him all the time. That, that was the manner of living. When... Uh, you know, she, she obeyed him when she put, uh, she made the, the, the cakes for the visiting angels that came. He had, she's a help for him, and he got, she got busy and did that. But the time that she called him Lord is when she's going to have a baby in their old age. Will my Lord be now happy because I've given him children suck in the old age? What will they say? My Lord. It was something that just came off her lips because it was constantly in her heart. She called him Lord. Obeyed him in subjection unto him, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose children ye are now, if you do well, and are not put, fear in, put to fear in any terror. It may be difficult to be living with an unbeliever. They may say, uh, you go to church, I'll, I'll, cut, I'll, I'll kill you. I'll, I will cause some persecution upon you. You do what's right. You do what's right. And don't, don't fear their fear, but you be in subjection to, to your... To, to the Lord. And so here was part of that, for I will be in subjection to my, my husband. Now, what does Titus say? That the word be not blasphemed. 
Now, he doesn't say that about the other things, the qualities. Why do you think he picks that one? What does that say about the culture that they lived in? That the word be not blasphemed if you are not in subjection to your husband. The word may be blasphemed. Why? Because there's a fellow out there who's probably not a Christian. He knows she's supposed to be in subjection to the husband. That's, that was the norm of the world. It still is, even those who are not Christians. Some places are pretty harsh. Woman's out on the street without a man, without her husband. She could be captured and put to death. So the culture knows this, and the, here's people live in the world. If a Christian is not in subjection to her husband, and they know that's what the word teaches. They even know that in their own conscience of what hey, way we're supposed to live. The word can be blasphemed. And if you care about the Lord, you never want that to happen. Your action blasphemed, cause the word to be blasphemed. They say, look here, these, she's a Christian. She's not doing that. And they may not be able to turn to the passages that we are saying, young lady, that, that's what you need to be with your husband uh, and your children. But the world may know about that too. And you don't ever want the word of God to be blasphemed. And we'll see the same thing with slavery in a few moments. Yes, sir, David. That's right. That's a good point. Yeah. That's exactly right. And, and that's, you know, be, bringing yourself under, under the subjection to another doesn't mean you're inferior to them. And yet that's the way the world wants to, to bring things. And that's caused a lot of people to, to reject the, the teachings of God. But we're here to see, well, that's what he demands. And there's the blessing that a husband has, even if they're not a believer, that they have a, a wife that's, that is subjected herself to the Lord. And therefore, he just got in the way and was blessed. <laughs> she will honor him as un, un, unto the Lord. All right. Next question, number nine. What characteristic is Titus to emphasize for younger men? Remember, we're in a context where we're looking at the doctrine of Christ, that good doctrine, how it translates into our lives. So we talked about older men. How can they be dignified? We spoke about that. What, what's older women? How are they supposed to behave? Uh, they're not to be addicted to wine. They're not to be blasphemers. They're not to be gossiping and telling lies about other people. Uh, specific things that are in harmony and demanded by the Word of God. Doctrine. And when people say, I just like to talk about relationships. I don't want to talk about doctrine. Then they're ignorant or they're just ignoring it. I mean, they're just ignorant that all of our relationships are hinged upon doctrine, teaching. And Titus is a great example of that. I think I'll talk about the relationship of uh, older men and older women in our society today. Ah, I'll, I'll listen to that one. But if you said, here's the doctrine, they don't want to listen. Or, or that teaching, that's divisive. Well, living life in a certain way can be divisive. And here is God bringing this together. This is the good doctrine. Older men, older women, younger women. Now we talk about younger men. So what characteristic is Titus to emphasize to the before and living before the younger men? What is that? What's their mind to be like? Sober. Sober. So they're not going to get drunk. Let's go to the next verse. No, it's a little deeper than that. That would be, I'm not going to choose to go out here and, and, and mess up my mind up with drugs and that sort of thing. But to be sober-minded is a characteristic that older men should have in verse 2. That they are alert, 
vigilant in their, in their thinking, sober-minded. They are aware of their surroundings. So, you know, if you're drunk, you can't do that too well. So it, it would not, it, it's not that it leaves that out of the idea, but it's the idea, I'm sober-minded. I'm not silly. That's what older men were to have a dignity about them. The life is, is not, well, it's a drudgery. It's, it's sober. I've got children, maybe. I need to realize I need to prepare for their future. I need to be a good example to them. I'm just not single anymore. Uh, maybe I am single. How am I going to treat the, the, the young girls? How, how am I going to be involved in dating them? I'm going to consider the younger women, as he was talking about, as sisters, as, P, as Paul told Timothy, uh, and, and to treat them with, with a concept of holiness, of uh, character is what we're talking about. And that was something that young men needed to understand. When you, spoke, when you speak about losing one's temper, there may be a lot of variables in that, but sometimes that's a younger man's problem. I don't know if older men get too old and say, I can't win that fight anyway, so I'm not gonna get mad. I don't know if that's the part of it. I can't whip that boy anyway, so I better, I better not get too mad at him. But younger men say, I whip anybody. The younger man says, you don't cross me. I got my rights. And the testosterone is running, running very full. And sometimes they can lose their temper at a drop of a hat. And that's sinful. We're not to have anger or wrath. And sometimes sober-mindedness. What is going to be happening if, if I get in the fight? If I stop that car and have this, this gunfight or, or knife fight, or we go we'll throw away our guns, I'll just do it with my fist. Let's get after it. And what's going to be the result of that? And you've got to think ahead of the consequences. That's sober-mindedness. What did Paul say when you're treated evil in Romans, the 12th chapter, that you are to consider what other people think? about what you are about to do. That comes into play. Render to no man evil for evil, but take thought for the things honorable in the sight of all men. And that's something that a sober mind will think about, that a mind that's not sober will not. It's just the situation. You cross the line with me, and we're gonna have it out, and we'll go to fist guffs or whatever. And sometimes it's the younger men that have a problem with their temper. Sometimes it's not changed. It, it gets to be older men too. But a lot of times there's a lot of factors involved. And younger men need to be sober-minded. They needed to understand there's consequences of their actions. Need to think that through. And don't, you, don't, you don't get to be 40 or 50 before you figure that's the way I'll live. You do it when you're young. Because you're to live a godly life. And even in a time when we are having evil, render not to anyone evil for evil. That's the, that's, that's the heat of battle. What do I do? Take thought for the things honorable in the sight of all men. Sometimes young men are physically abusive to their young wives. And that's something that people don't talk about. But it's a reality. Anger. Losing temper, I'm stronger than she, and he doesn't honor the weaker vessel, like Paul, uh, Peter says. But he takes advantage of that and abuses her. That happens. That's sinful. And younger men need to understand, have a sober mind. What am I doing? What's going to be the consequence of it? He doesn't see that. He just reacts. And he can do it, and he loses his temper. And... She's a punching bag for a while. Oh, I'm sorry. I'll never do that again. And sometimes it keeps going. And so we want to solve those problems. Teach them to be sober-minded. Not to, not to lose their temper. Think ahead. It, is it honorable to hit a woman? You want your neighbor to know that? He's not a Christian. Why do he care? You want him to know that? No. Because even in the world, there are things that men realize this is honorable and this is not. And our world's messed up, but right now, I think it's still dishonorable for a man 
to strike a woman. Any place, anytime, anywhere. That's just not, that's not wise. Even when you might feel it, even when you get to the point she deserves it, oh, I, I don't want to go there. And sober-mindedness helps us overcome our tendencies, our, our situations, and younger men need to control that, especially. Everybody else needs to also. But that's a reality that happens. And God changes us from the inside. And we don't, well, we'll put them in a safe environment or, you know, change the environment, it'll change. No, we change hearts. That's what God does. He works from the inside out. But when you get Titus, you live before them with sober mindedness. That's the way the older men are supposed to live anyway. That's the way a Christian is supposed to live. When you do that, you, you, you mirror that out there. As you are mentoring them, be an example to the younger men. You're a younger man at that time. You especially be sober-minded. And that was what he was to emphasize. And I think that's something that younger men especially need. Any, any comments or, or questions on nine? All right, question number 10. Of what was Titus to be an example? He's going to be encouraging that sober minus, and he'll have to live as an example. But in all things... Showing thyself an example of what? Good, of, of good works. And uh, again, that which is beautiful in its being, because it's the doctrine of Christ, but it's going to be effectual. It'll be a blessing to those around you. You're doing good works, not evil works. And you'll be an example of that which is good. Well, how would I know what is good? Remember what Timothy was instructed with the scriptures? And from a babe, he's known the scriptures by his, his mother and grandmother. His father wasn't a believer. And Paul, in that context, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's God breathed. You're getting it straight. The mind of God is coming straight to you through the scriptures, that which is written. All scripture is God breathed. It's profitable for doctrine. We don't, we don't turn our nose up at doctrine. Everything is, it needs to be based upon doctrine, teaching. That's why I can go back to it and see how I'm supposed to be. Doctrine, reproof for correction. I need to change some things in my life. I'll do that according to the scriptures. That the man of God may be thoroughly furnished unto what? Every good work. We'll learn from the scriptures what's good. What is good in its character and being because it's authorized by God and it'll be good in effect. So here you've got a young man and in his life he's showing sober-mindedness already. That should attract a godly woman and appreciate that when he sees that he's thinking soberly when he's young. You've got wives in subjection to their husbands and everything. Word of God's not being blasphemed. There's order in the home. There's the, the love and the respect for one another. And they're, they're, they're different in being male and female, but they're interdependent. There's not a man that has not come to this world that wasn't from a woman. <laughs> you, we, we wouldn't be here if it weren't for women. And the women need that a weaker vessel, protection, and all those things, and their harmony where they can bring forth children into the world. Two men don't do that. Two women don't do that. God's order is there. And as bringing people into the world, having that natural affection, or hey, these children, they didn't come from my, from my body. Well, you learn to treat them as, as they do. There's that home order because of relationship to God. And I say there's no improvement on that. We've seen that change, try to change. I've seen, I've, I've talked to couples and said, well, we, I'm not in subjection to him. It's a 50-50 proposition. Okay, they made it work out. It's 50-50. It's just right down the middle. That's not the way God ordered it. And, there's, and they've had problems in their marriage down the road. Uh, because there's, there's a conflict there. But the point is, is that the Lord has never mistreated you, women. Lord has never mistreated you. That's who you're in subjection to, and he's blessed by it. And what a man you have that will give himself up his time, 
his energy. He's tired, but he does something for you. Self-sacrifice for you. There's not or anything more attractive than that. Even when his jokes get stale and he gets old and bald and all those things. That, well, I, I don't remember that man. Well, he doesn't remember you either like that. Works both ways. But you love one another. Because there's that, there's that connection with one another that's deeper than just outward appearance. It's character. And God's way has never been improved upon because he's the one that created us. And so there's the good works. It'll come from teachings of, of God's word. So what, to what words uncorruptness and gravity refer? We've talked about gravity being that which is serious, that which is honorable, that which is therefore dignified. What's it applied to here in these next verses? In thy doctrine, showing uncorruptness, this is from my, my American Standard translation, and gravity, or dignity, or seriousness. Well, we get the word grave. Uh, what does that refer to? The teaching, isn't it? David, you have something to add to that? Yeah. And the integrity is the strength that when it's corrupt, it's going to be weakened in it. So it's not going to be uh, as strong as you have that. How many people today that you talk to care about the doctrine that's being taught to your church? That talk about, is it really the truth? Is it being watered down? What about the doctrine you're teaching? I don't find many people talking about that. They're talking about, well, I can get out of it, relationships and all these sort of things. What do you do for my kids? What are you going to do for this or that? I don't hear that serious talk about, well, what are they teaching up there? What does that man preach? When I hear him preach, what, what, uh, what do I know about the Word of God? Uh, eh, it's not too serious about all that. Makes me feel good when I leave, and that's all I care about. Well, smorgasbord religion. We get what we want. We take what we, we, we think we need. You, you meet felt needs, you'll be a popular preacher. The hard part is getting people to feel the needs that God says you ought to feel. That's difficult preaching. That's the business of preaching. That's what we're teaching here. I want you to be that type of person. And you may not feel good as we go through the difficulties of getting there. That's what will make you strong. And that's doctrine that's sound and healthy. I want to be a part of those people that care about the doctrine, that care about my marriage as well, care about my children, care about those things. But it's centered. It all comes back to healthy teaching, not just teaching, sound doctrine. That's what we're looking at here. And he says, you make sure, Titus, what you're teaching these people on the island of Crete, that is strong, integ there's integrity, there's strength there, it's not corrupting from the inside. And it is the seriousness because it's from God. And God has spoken a lot that a lot of times we don't talk about much. It's there in the Word. That's what a preacher has to do. He's got to bring that out. And we have to apply that. So I hope we will always care about the character of the teaching that's being done here. And our elders will be doing that too. All right. Now we're going to deal with something. Yes, sir, Richard? Yeah. I want to make sure it's so. And you can do that too. We all have that ability to, uh, to reason. Paul, well, we, we, I don't want to go there. We'll, we'll hit that later. What is meant by the slave serving master of the game? He says, don't tune out. Just put yourself there, and you'll see the demands that are placed upon slaves that have become Christians. Or maybe they've always been Christians. 
and uh, they and they they've just become slaves. A lot of a lot of slavery in the first century is not based upon as our slave was race. You know, we'll we'll pick on a certain race. A lot of times it was paying back debts. You were indebted to somebody, and you you work that out, and then you you were no longer uh, a slave to those people. And but still, slavery was something that if you could get out of. Paul says in First Corinthians seven, do so. If you can't, then glorify God in that relationship. Here's glorifying God when they couldn't get out of that relationship. So we're not arguing whether slavery is bad or good, whether God says it's okay or not. Uh, the abuses of that were there, and even Peter will talk about, even if the, if the master is crooked and forward towards you, you serve him anyway. That's hard to do. And the temptation would be, I don't want to be a part of that, but a Christian is. And that's why I look at this. I, I want to put myself there. Would I, would I be following this teaching as well? And I hope I would be. So one of the things he's saying, do this without gainsaying. So I'm, I'm picking up verse, a sound speech that cannot be a contrary part, maybe that'd be a shame having no evil thing to say of us. So your sound teaching is going to be, be that which cannot be condemned. You can say, here's what the word of God says. And then they're going to see the character that they'll be ashamed of being against because it's, it's wholly good, beneficial to everyone. But exhort servants to be in subjection to their own masters, like their own husbands, wives bringing themselves under their, their authority. So here's a master. I must do the same thing. To be well-pleasing to them in all things, not gainsaying. Now, what does your version say? What does that last word in verse 9 say in your Bibles? What? Yeah. That, and so, no, I, I'm not going to take advantage of them, gainsaying. It's argumentative. It's speaking back. Do you let your children speak back to you? Don't talk back to your mother like that. We do that all the time, don't we? Well, they're not, they're not slaves. But that's the point. Here you were with a master saying, you go do that. What do you do? Well, I think that's a stupid idea, master. <laughs> I'm not going to do it. And that wasn't going to be what you did. Gainsaying, speaking back, showing, uh, being argumentative about that. Here was a situation where you might have to endure some stupid things and some very hard things that they would have you to do. I put myself there. I, I would need to do that. But you know what? There may be something else. I will do that for a while and I'll be looking at things that I might steal from him. Is that going to be okay? What's the next thing? Not purloining. <laughs> That's stealing. That's, that's thievery. That's saying, well, I can take some of his possessions. I'm here doing this dirty work. He didn't pay me anything. I'm going I'm to, I can rationalize. But God says, no, you're not going to talk back and you're not going to steal from them. Because those are two things. If they were to, if you want to fill out your resume, what's his resume as a slave? He's going to be my slave now. What, 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 is, what is he like? Well, he's argumentative and you better watch him. He steals him any time he can. That would be bad. That would be bad. And by the way, he's a Christian. That would be worse. You're not going to let those things see. They may charge you with that. I think that boy's stealing from me. I think that man's been stealing when they've lost something. And they're not necessarily so. You're not to give them that. They're not to have any indication that's your character. You're not argumentative and you're not stealing with them. You're showing all good Fidelity, being faithful. You're a faithful slave. And God exalts that. Not because of the work, not because of the relationship. He tells 1 Corinthians 7, you can get out of that, do so. If not, you glorify the Lord in that. And this is how you do it. And what an unbelieving master would see, I trust him with the most precious things that I have. The most difficult job I need done. 
under the most difficult circumstances, dirty jobs, cold jobs, hot jobs. He's, he's there in season, out of season. You make an impression. You know why you're doing that? Because the world will not act that way, but a Christian does. And that's why he says that they may adorn the doctrine of God. And that's our question. How does one adorn, thank you, the doctrine of God? He adorns the doctrine of God, our Savior, in all things. What is, what is the Holy Spirit working through Paul, writing to Titus? What has he just done to slavery? He didn't end it. He didn't say, now you don't do that, but you, you march and we'll get our freedom. He didn't do that. He never does. But what does the word adorn mean to you? This idea, I'm adorning something. And everything you said was true. But what if I inject what the word really means? We, we, we have a working definition, that's it, I put it on. I adorn it. But wonder if the definition means to beautify. Would that fit with what you just said? But what it does, it takes it from willpower. I did something. Look at me, I put it on. Look how godly I am. And that, that's not what you're saying. But that's when we put something on, that's, that's what we do. We're, we're putting it on. But if we understand that the word originally means to beautify, you beautify it by putting it on that people see. But there's a mindset. I want, I want them to see the beauty of the teachings of God and see how it looked in real life. I want him to be glorified. I want to adorn the doctrine of God. Because when you practice it, when you wear it, you beautify God. I want us to think like that too. That's to be, that's important. I still remember, to me, it's the greatest illustration of Mayberry, Aunt B. you remember her? She won a mink coat on some game show in Hollywood. And she brought it back to Mayberry. And she was debating with her lady friends if she ought to wear it or not. Most people in Mayberry, North Carolina, didn't have a mink coat. Especially in that little town. And so there was the drama in, in the story. And they were so happy with that B. She won something. She won something. She, she won a mink coat. They, and they were so happy with her until she wore it. And when she wore it in downtown Mayberry, the ladies got mad. They get jealous. They start snapping who she thinks she is. Well, they knew she had it. But when she adorned it, when she put it on, it made a quite a bit of difference, didn't it? And of course, it was a negative side of that. That's the jealousy and that's the, that's, that's the way we might look at that. But do you want to be a slave? You want my job? No, I don't think so. And I probably wouldn't act the way you are, but who in the world would ever do that? A Christian. I'm putting on, as Eric was saying, I'm putting on, it's willpower. Yes, it is. It's determination. And what happens when we put it on, we adorn that dog. We got it on, but we got it on for people to see. And the only thing that would beautify is God. Because man surely wouldn't act that way. They would get even by stealing, or they'd feel better by talking back. And none of that's happening. Fidelity, 
faithfulness. That's all they see. And who gets that glory? Not man's wisdom and not your willpower. It's the fact that you wanted to beautify the doctrine of Christ. And you do that by applying it. And that's going to take willpower. It's going to be putting, you've got to put it on. It's going to mean you're going to have to live godly. But what a motive it is that, God, I want them to see your beauty. And they will not see that in this world, especially in this relationship. I am a slave. And I can't get out of it. But I should sure glorify God in that relationship. I hope that's clear enough just to see that we can appreciate that. Our, our next lesson will be lesson four. We won't get into that. It's a very short lesson. But it deals with the grace of God. I hope you'll look at these verses that we have here in lesson four. Lesson five and six are in there. Uh, well, we haven't made room for six yet, but it, it will come. And we'll, we'll continue on. Thank you for your participation and your presence.